So one of the things that I wanted to get to, and you are uh, with Black Power Media, you know, and you guys are talking about a lot of Black issues that are, you know, that are imperative for us to keep, you know, within the front of our brains, uh, you know, especially not just within our community, but also letting, you know, the broader community out there know, you know, what our concerns are, and you guys do it from a left perspective. Um, what drove you uh, to be in this space, and how did you get into the community organizing as well? If you can give us uh, that view from 30,000 feet. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, start, the easier story is the, the Black Power Media story. Uh, I and uh, um, co-host at the time of Kalanji Jamachanga and our producer, the Ear Doctor, were doing a podcast called Renegade Culture. Um, we had known and I had known Jad for like 25 or 30 years, and he was like, what I like. And then we frequently did, were guests on each other's shows. And I think Kalanji came up with the idea of, look, we needed to build out a larger platform for Black radicals uh, to talk about the issues that we were concerned about, to talk about revolutionary nationalist politics, radical politics, to critique uh, U.S. foreign policy, U.S. imperialism, uh, obviously the U.S. domestic policy, talk things around culture, uh, and all that good stuff. And so we formed, I think we're going on two years, uh, Black Power Media, and you know, I guess I think similar to the stuff that you guys do um, is, you know, it's a series of different video podcasts, different hosts, different times, uh, but the discussion is already are always geared towards uh, what is it that we can be talking about that gets us more organized and more politicized. But I agree with you, the the, the YouTube algorithms are not in our favor, so we depend a lot on word of mouth and so forth. My yeah. organizing background, um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my mom is from Charleston, South Carolina. Well, what's from Charleston, South Carolina? She passed away last year. Um, and she grew up doing Jim Crow. And she would tell us a lot of stories about growing up under Jim Crow, including when she got hit in the back by a white cop when she was running out of a whites only uh, playground with her friends and she was a little slow. And so she had a scar on her back until the day she died. Um, and so when you hear that story, you know, as a kid, it sort of obviously it resonates, it sticks with you, it makes you investigate more. It got me looking into like the civil rights movement and started reading. I think there were other things around, even my mother's racial politics that had me sort of questioning how the world works. Um, I'm a fair skin, uh, uh, light skin dude. My mom's a dark skin uh, black woman. My sister's uh, probably your complexion. Uh, and my mom would say that she, purposely had kids uh, to make them lighter, even though she might have been, been uh, uh, happy with the company she kept, but she had kids making them lighter because she thought that would make it easier for them in the world. And again, this is mind blowing, right? To hear, to think about that, to, to think about how this country and the world operates where people actually think through that or they're conditioned to believe that these things are important in a way that they are presented to them. Um, sure. All of that got me to thinking and reading and uh, in my teens, my late, late teens, uh, when I started reading Malcolm X, um, it was like this, you know, a long time ago, this was in the eighties, um, a little bit before the movie and stuff came out. Again, it just radicalized me uh, to the point where I wanted to start joining organizations and being involved in my community. Um, I'll wrap up this way. Lastly, uh, you know, obviously pre-internet, but I was so far gone that I started looking in the phone book for Malcolm's organization, the uh, uh, Organization of Afro-American Unity, which, and again, this was like 25 years or 20 some odd years after his, his, his assassination. So of course it wasn't in the phone book, but that's how naive I was. I was like, let me look through and see if I can find something. Uh, but in college, I started finding different organizations to join. Uh, my first real black radical organization was called the uh, organization, the African Christian Organization. Um, I wasn't a Christian. I was, a, I was an atheist. I was that before I was even politicized, but that got me on my realm. Like those folks introduced me to other folks who just introduced me to other folks. And I joined a whole bunch of different black radical organizations in my youth. The one I stuck with was called the Malcolm X grassroots movement. I was with them for 17, 18 years. I left that group around 10 years ago and started community movement builders, which is in a lot of ways patterned after some of the ideas of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Those politics still matter to me but have been organizing um, for over 30 years uh, based on the things that I believe in, that I studied, 
that made sense to me around radical black politics and still do it today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're reminding me of what Kwame Ture said about all the great leaders that we have attributed to radical politics. They all belong to different organizations. Like, for instance, uh, we talk a, a lot about, um, oh, my God, I'm blanking on his name for right now. This is embarrassing. Um, but he's from South Africa. Um, but uh, Biko? I'm sorry. Steve Biko? No, no, no. Um, he was part I, of the, the African National Congress. Um, not, not, um, obviously not Mandela. Yeah, Mandela. That's oh, okay. Yeah. But, you know, he was talking about how Mandela was part of the, the National, African National Congress. Uh, you had Martin Luther King that was part of the Southern Leadership Congress. You had many different things, many different people who were part of different organizations. But the, necess the necessity for being part of organizations is what helps us to build a dual power outside of this capitalist system. Because as long as we continuously depend on this system, we'll have to depend on the system, so to speak. So that's one thing that, he, you know, he made it abundantly clear that we have to belong to some type of organization or create an organization so that we can build community so that we can move away from the systems, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what it reminded me when you were speaking of this, which is imperative for people like myself to join organizations, people who are watching to join different organizations that are about building community, because we can talk about the problems all day long, but it's just like, and I was talking to a friend earlier about this. It's just like when you go to a doctor and the doctor says, okay, we're going to have to put you on a weight loss program. Uh, you can't eat this, 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 or that. And that's when you go, okay, what can I eat? But the thing is, if the doctor's not telling you what you can mm -hmm, have, mm -hmm. then it leads you to search blindly for what you can, and you might miss the mark. Mm -hmm. So what the best thing for us to do is to also offer the solutions, be like, okay, we can't do this, but here's the alternative. Right? Yeah, I completely agree, yeah. I mean, I, I, and I, you know, I'm not... Um, you know, a podcaster, a commentator by training. I never call myself a journalist or whatever. I, sometimes it's like, no, I'm not. I'm not a journalist. I make commentary. I do some left wing punditry. I do a little writing. But at its heart, I believe the things, and I think those things are important, right? I think those things are the things that people may catch or read or see that they spark something. Um, as like when I was younger and reading something sparked something for me. But the actual things that help us create changes in our conditions and fight for me have always led back to joining and or starting organizations uh, with all the issues that that incurs, right? Organizations, you know, not only ideological issues you got to deal with, but personality differences, why people join, you know, what people are trying to get out of it, personal relationships that develop, sexual relationships that people develop. Um, what happens these days with 501c3s and what that means when people actually give you money who are connected to capitalist systems and how that distorts um, certain frameworks of organizing. All, even with all of that considered, with all of that we have to go through uh, and the do's and don'ts, I still believe essentially that until we build organization to do what you said, to build and fight, uh, we will always be sort of lacking and or behind the curve when it comes to really fighting for our rights or making changes in our neighborhood or politicizing people in base building. And at its heart, I think if we don't base build, no matter what else we do, then we're never going to get like, let's say the masses of folks with us or behind us, or even a critical mass of people behind us or with us to fight and to make changes. So I always feel like, excuse me, the starting point is going to be organizing. Everything yeah. else is good to do, but organizing is so much, so much the, the essence of the work that we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And, and in that same vein, uh, I just want to direct people's attention to the community website, communitymovementbuilders.org. Uh, this is beautifully made website, by the way. And it says our mission is rooted in black and sustainability. And it talks about uh, anti- Well, that, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That heart is supposed to be black love and sustainability. I know it doesn't oh, always black. translate. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's still black. We, we don't care. <laughs> It says our fights, it says Community Movement Builders is a black member based collective community, residents and activists serving black working class and poor black communities. CMB emerged out of the need to respond to encroaching gentrification 
displacement and over policing. CMB organizes to bring power to black communities by challenging existing institutions and creating new ones that our people control. And then you talk about anti gentrification and police violence and food sustainability, which really, in my opinion, are also in, in the same vein as really going a more black and anti capitalist type of route. Um, and so I just want to put, make sure I put the link in the chat for people. It's also in the description, but this is also very important because, you know, uh, I, I just want to say thank you as well for, uh, you know, pushing community movement building as much as possible, because I think this is, this is where we, this is where it needs to lie, lay, I should say. And so one of the things, uh, you know, in another conversation with a friend, one of the things I said was, what made people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., people like Fannie Lou Hamer, people like um, Fred Hampton, Malcolm X, what made them dangerous? And their danger wasn't their, their risk to public safety. No, their danger was the fact that they actually made the public more safe. Because when we talk about public safety, like I, when I talk about public safety, I talk about healthcare, housing, um, education. These are things that actually make us more safe. And so when you're the type of person that organizes your community into making it more safe, then the powers that be, what I like to call the corporate dictators, they don't like that because mm -hmm. they want to be the vehicle which it, you know, through public safety, but they keep it unsafe so that you continuously depend off of them. Whereas we're trying to make it so that we don't have a job anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so if you like to speak a little bit to that as well, I, I, that's, you know, that's the conversation I was having earlier. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, in, in addition or added on to that part is yes, the work that we do explicitly says we're going to try to fill the gaps of what the state has purposely made sure that we don't receive, i.e. resources and power, right? Um, and they'll give a minimal, they'll give some options, uh, but it's never going to be enough to uh, have us uh, sort of be in charge or have power over our communities, right? And these working class and poor black communities, like we don't have the power to dictate what stores come in, how the buildings go up in our communities. Uh, we don't have the power to decide um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, as in gentrification, the rate of increase in terms of rentals or even mortgages. None of that is within our power or our control. Um, and so when we fight back, even with providing resources, it's always done from the level of how are we doing this to show how we lack power and then how we can gain power. So I say that to say that the thing that all that that really does scare the state is when you are anti-capitalist, um, whether that's socialist, anarchist, or 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 communist. But when you're anti-capitalist in any of those frameworks, you're suggesting to folks that there's another vision around how resources can be distributed and how power can be organized that's different than how capitalists make you think the world should operate. It doesn't mean that you know overnight there's about to be a revolution. But it does mean that you start to present these ideas, new structures, these challenges to the systems at play as you fight in the essence of like doing community organizing, which can be a, a you know, a, a bevy of different tactics and strategies to go down that road. But you keep in mind and you keep letting people know and you keep preventing, presenting them with alternative structures around how the world and how their community and how, how we can, our neighborhoods can operate. And I think that's the other thing that makes us, uh, quote unquote, where we, where we can be, quote unquote, dangerous to them. It's the idea that we're not going to rely on you to make these decisions or let you make these decisions. Not only are we going to challenge you, but we're also going to go about our own way of creating new institutions that we control ourselves and that they don't like. Yeah, I think, you know, self-determination is one of the hallmarks of what the black community wants and you know we see that as well as many other different communities like for instance the indigenous community they want their own self-determination we look at different countries where they want their own self-determination uh you know you have you know countries you know like uh sudan and countries like um somalia and you know uh bolivia and um 
you know, Nicaragua, you know, they want their own self-determination, but yet the United States keeps taking their grubby little hands and going in and saying, no, we want you to do things our way so that we can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. You know, and we see that we know this from our community. And so we respect this about other communities as well, other countries, you know, outside of us. But yeah, I, I'd say quickly on that, you know, I, at our essence is that 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 word is extremely important, the self-determination concept. So, you know, we work with everybody and anybody on different issues, coalitions, alliances and so forth. But in the end, we also believe that we as a people have the power and should have the power to determine our destinies and again, our communities and what happens in those communities. Um, and so you're completely right. And I think that's why in terms of our history here in this country, why, you know, it's not as much as it used to be because there's a lot of there's a lot of bourgeois politicians being brought off um, and there's a lot of mainstream culture and media that shifts us into the pockets um, of those who are basically oppressing us. But we yeah. still can see that our community is the community that is most likely to see through the BS of U.S. capitalism, to see through the, the BS of U.S. hegemony and to question it and to comment on it. We may not always know which way forward, but we can see pretty well when someone is lining up um, against the interests of black communities, which is why we have so many great buzzwords like sellout and the rest of it, uh, describe folks when they do that kind of stuff. So there's, yeah. there's, uh, it's an important thing for us to understand how self-determination um, in our community should work um, and how we should be siding and working with other folks, but never give up our, our ability to decide for ourselves how we want to go and which way forward. Oh, true, true. And